I wouldn't do a lot of these things if I, if I thought about them too hard, which makes it, things much more yeah. fun. And then you improvise, which is sort of my training as a musician or as a human being. I discuss this with my, my sister a lot because she likes to think it through and, and plan. And, um, but I have way more fun, you know, and just like that. <laughs> By the seat of my pants. If you're looking to connect with other like-minded people and go deeper with me and my work and my guides, the Z's, then you might want to check out The Portal, my monthly members community. Every month you get access to a host of wellness tools that include a 90-minute live energy tune-up broadcast with me, free monthly recordings, Qigong body energy updates from Stephen Washington, a members-only community forum, so much more, and special discounts. To learn more, visit the link below, and I hope to see you inside the portal. Hello, welcome to Impact the World. My guest today is a creative and somebody who has been impacting my world ever since I first heard her music around 27 years ago. Jane Sibbery is a Canadian musical artist, visual artist, and Jane was making records back in the early 80s and was a very prolific recording artist for many, many years with major recording labels. And then she did something quite revolutionary in the mid 90s. She decided to set up her own independent record label, which nowadays seems kind of normal. But back then, it was unheard of for a major label artist to go and do this in this way. So I spoke to Jane about her relationship to music, specifically a song called Calling All Angels, which is the song that. I first heard of Jane's and which many of you may have heard before. It's a beautiful, transcendent song. The original was a duet with Katie Lang. Jane wrote the song and the song was later used in a movie called Pay It Forward and various films and TV shows uh, because it has this incredible feeling and message within it. But Jane is known for many of her songs because of the way that they were able to touch people. So it's lovely to get to have a chat with Jane about who she is as a creative and she has always forged a unique path. It's one of the things I enjoy about being a member of her audience. And so to get to hear from her firsthand how she feels about things, thinks about things, and also to hear about the time that she changed her name. So in the 2000s, she completely changed her name, changed so much about her life, got rid of her possessions, essentially breaking ties with her past in order to reinvent herself. So to hear about that was fascinating. So hope you enjoy this conversation with Jane Sibbery. You can find Jane's work and music at janesibbery.com. She has a great newsletter too, if you want to follow that and get Jane's latest creations that way. And if you enjoy this show, Impact the World, it really helps us if you leave a rating or a review or you subscribe on whatever channel or format you're watching on or listening to. It helps us as, as an independent show to reach more people. So thank you very much for taking the time to do that. And here is Jane Sibbery. Jane, thank you so much for being here. It's, um, it's a real treat for me to have you here on the show because the ethos of the show is creatives impacting the world. And you're a creative who impacted my world almost about 27 years ago when I first discovered your work. So thank you for being here. Um, so I thought maybe I would kick us off by just explaining how I first came to hear of you. I was at my university course and they gave us five rhythms dance, otherwise known as ecstatic dance in some circles. And the person who was facilitating the class had laid out all of these songs and all of a sudden near the end of this one hour of free movement, on came this song called Calling All Angels. And I had never heard anything like it. It was one of those moments where you get very activated by a sound that feels familiar and home and has so many layers to it. 
So I immediately rushed over to him at the end and I'm like, who's that? Who's that? What's that song? Because this is back in the day before we had Shazam or, you know, the internet. And he gave me your name. He gave me the title of the song and Calling All Angels in the form I heard was a duet that you did with Katie Lang, who another artist I loved. And it's a song that you wrote and it has gone on to have this other life. It was used in the song, in, in the film, Pay It Forward. And it's a song that many people know in my world. And so it was the song that led me to you and all of your work. So I'm, I'm really curious because Calling All Angels to me is a deeply spiritual song or that's what it meant to me. What was it that really brought that song into existence from your vantage point? I thought we'd just dive straight into creativity and I'm curious what, it, what that song means to you and how it came to be. Um, first, it was like an acoustic song just played by myself on guitar. And as I recorded it for the, rec the record, I realized it wasn't the right arrangement. So the big push inside me was to have it float more. So we did different versions, you know, with a band. And then finally I said, pull out all the um, rhythm markers and let's just let it float. So that's when... Um, we we worked with Ken Meyer, the guitarist, who <clears throat> made a lot of sustains, and it it uh, opened the song right up and felt right to me. So we added a bit of rhythm just in a kick drum, I think, and um, we we slowed it down too. So I don't know how artists know what the right thing is, but it's I always feel like it's already written or it's a template that we're we're trying to match um as we sort of are in life i think our own template um because we get these clear guide and guidances so it was um yeah it was song song of longing and it's become a gift to me very different than when it when i started it's turned around and become you know uh, a gift and it's um, a place, you know, where you can, you know, when I, I think we're laughing and crying at the same time, that strange feeling, um, you know, where you're being pulled up into the light at the same time, something's pulling your legs downwards and feels like watery, like a river. And to me, that's the, the essence of that song. That was long, I'm sorry. No, not at all. It was, it was great. I, I, I actually have the handwritten lyrics of that song from you because many years ago you, you offered on your website that you would handwrite lyrics for favorite songs. And I've read those lyrics many times. They're very poetic. And I'm curious for you, do the lyrics, I mean, maybe it's different for each song, but do the lyrics come all at once? Was there a, a through line for you with the lyrical content of that song or was it a little more ephemeral? The, the original version was um, done for a folk festival <clears throat> in Canada, and I was on stage with John Prine, so I, I sort of wrote it quickly as a sort of country-ish song, and it was more about a person. And then that didn't mm -hmm. feel right after a certain point, so that's when I shifted everything to me and the universe as the person. And, um, and the lyrics came bit by bit and I remember recording in Vancouver and I was riding my bicycle across the bridge um, and bridges are very remarkable I don't know why but um, I feel I felt like I changed as I crossed the bridge as I often did and by the time I got on the slope going downhill I had the final missing line so I pulled off and and plugged it in and it all made sense. I can't tell you what line it was, but it was um, bit by bit and from sort of an inner pressure that it wasn't quite what it was supposed to be yet. Hmm. It's funny of, of all of your songs and your, I, I always find your songs very reflective on the human condition, the human experience in a way that's very pleasing to me. But, but that song to me has always felt a little like a prayer. And I'm, I'm curious what it's like for you as the creator of that piece 
and then you have people like me and from all over the world who have a relationship with that song. What's it like when a song like that has gone on and had its own journey in the world in this way and then and then it comes back to you? What's your relationship to it today or that phenomena of other people having this this journey with your songs? Um, it, it's a sense of community because I feel like I'm part of a stream where the same thing means something means the same thing to me as many other people and that song comes sort of from the deepest place in me so i find it comforting when when it when it moves other people it feels right and that it's maybe the um clearest example for me when i when i'm unsure where i fit into this world um that um that there is a harmony between me and the rest of humanity um, about really important things. Because often when one feels like wondering where one fits in, it's because things that are important to you aren't important to other people. And you think, I'd... so um, it's probably been a huge comfort to me that way in my life. Hmm. How how has music been for you? Because I always think of music, it's one thing to be a creator of it, it's another thing to be someone who listens to it, enjoys it, receives it. And music to me is such a unifier compared to so many other things in this world. Music is a kind of universal language. So how has music been either a support to you or a, a, an informant to you. And I don't mean as the creator of songs and, and music. I mean, just as a person in the world, what, what role has music played in your life? Well, sometimes I feel a bit obvious, actually, because people, it seems like other people get the thrill of listening to music over and over again. And I, I, I don't really do that. And I sort of, envy people sometimes because I know it it's um it's a beautiful world to be in <clears throat> but um I I guess for me the pull for music is more listening to what I hear because that seems to be part of the 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 writing thing so I don't want to be too influenced by um too much um, so I can just hear clearly without too much pulling. So sometimes I wish I, I, you know, I wish I could just be like so many other people. I love that song. I listen to it over and over again. Oh, it was like, but um, doesn't seem to be for me. But I um, get to really enjoy music as a music maker when I'm making it. Then I feel very fecund and healthy because. Um, there's a sense of magnetism, you know, because it's you you choose something that comes to you that sticks and lots of songs come and go for me. But when it sticks, it has this um, magnetism that feels it's so much fun, like being in playground as this idea comes in and sticks or not. And that idea just comes in a very orderly way. And and then I get the physical joy of it as I'm listening to it, especially the demos, because you haven't final, finalized it yet, so it still has an openness. And then um, and then after it's done, I rarely get to hear it the way, I rarely get to hear it anew anymore. Do you find that time helps with that? I know for myself, if we've just finished something, I can't hear it clearly. But sometimes I'll hear something two or three years later and I'll hear it because I'm I'm no longer thinking I can work on it or tweak things. Does that happen for you or not, yeah, or not really? I, I, I think you might be asking if yeah. I can't listen to my own music because I'm always trying to fix little things. Is that what you're saying? Oh, no, not, no, not, I, I, that would, that's something that I, when we're in the mix stage, that's what you're always listening to. So I, I find I have to be away from the release of the record for me to just listen to it objectively without still being in the world of it and tweaking things or checking the balance of it kind of thing. So no, I was more wondering if for you, the same is true that years later, you can hear it 
more objectively yeah. as yeah years later or at surprising times that's I guess what I meant with mm. only rarely do you get to hear your own music as an outsider like like in a gracious way where you're not um imposing on it who you are they go oh yeah. wow that's really I like that and to lift yourself up is amazing um when it happens every now and then and hmm. often i don't quite understand some of the words they, i mean i'm not saying it it's just a freebie when i write songs i'm i'm trying to have it make sense as i go but there are some things i leave in that i know i should leave in and i don't understand them till later because it's part of the my growth or whatever and then and then uh and i have a few songs in the future that i'm writing and they don't quite and i've asked people about them too like does this make sense when i'm saying like i'm counting on this for the sun to come up every, every morning for the for the birds to come up shortly after dawn i'm counting on these things it's like you sound like the world's going to um it's going to disappear or but that's i know in in my stomach that's not what i mean but the words somehow aren't so that's the kind of song where you have to watch it and allow it and then later i i have an understanding of why that song makes sense although maybe when i release it it won't make sense for 10 years cuz i'm often like not quite in alignment with what's in the air or i am but not on a larger level if you know what i mean I, I do. I mean, I think that's one of the things, Jane, I've always loved about you. So, like I said, I think I first heard you in 95. And then it was shortly after. So back in the day, and you know, for anyone who's younger listening or watching to this, imagine a time where you used to have to go to the CD store, find the CD or the record. And in, in the case of you, I used to have to order them and wait for them to come from Canada or wherever the UK distributor was um, to England. But then you did an amazing thing that was absolutely fascinating to me ahead of your time, which I think you often are. You're often pioneering new ways of doing things that aren't necessarily adopted into the mainstream yet. You became an independent record store, which at that time, I didn't know many artists who were doing that. So you decided to set up your own label called Sheba. And for many years, you ran Sheba independently. I would then be ordering CDs directly from your store. And, you know, I mean, it was, it was, it sounds normal now, but back then we just, that we weren't seeing that, that wasn't happening. So what compelled you to do that? Because yes, it's freeing maybe, but it's also a huge amount of work and a lot to figure out. I'm curious what that journey was like for you of going independent after many years of being with record labels. Uh, in my blissful ignorance, <laughs> I, I am. Um, I thought it would be easier than it was. Never figuring out that, you know, it, it was a big journey. And so, um, the biggest, the most difficult part was that I had to find a way to fund new records. But if I had them funded, I could sell enough to keep going. But that was a big thing I hadn't taken into consideration. So <laughs> I know it sounds like I'm smart, but anyway, um, I wouldn't do a lot of these things if I, if I thought about them too hard, which makes it, things much more yeah. fun. And then you improvise, which is sort of my training as a musician or as a human being. So um, I discuss this with my, my sister a lot because she likes to think it through and, and plan. And, um, but I have way more fun, you know, and just like that. <laughs> by the seat of my pants. But, um, yes, yeah, so it, it was very special. I not only had to learn about um, – I had to learn how to run a company. I had to learn how to manage people. I had to um, – figure out contracts and um, I had to, you know, I kept looking for business managers to say, are we going to make it or should I just stop right now? You know, but that never happened, fortunately. So I kept going and making mistakes. And um, 
I took courses on, you know, small businesses and um, learned how to program websites. And um, so it was a myriad of learning and decisions and uh, really intense sometimes. I, you know, I'd get a letter thanking me for helping them uh, in the daytime. And then um, that night I'd get a letter from a volunteer suing me because um, I hadn't treated her her the way she wanted to be treated for example um uh, and she was in love with me there was an agenda and not reciprocated so like it's like "Mm, i don't know who i am i don't know what i mean you know what do these energies mean coming at me so that was a long wonderful period and finally i just decided simple is better got rid of everything and everybody and reduced it as much as I could. And at the same time, I think that's when I also um, sold my house slash office and um, got rid of all my things best I could, um, except for archival things. And that was a huge change in lightening myself up. So I I didn't, um, felt like I was heavy, so heavy, um, and changed my name to Isa for three years. Hmm. I remember that very well, and that was a that was that was a, a fascinating journey of yours to be witness to and privy to as as a member of your audience at the time, and then after you were Issa for a few years, you decided to go back. I'm curious what what do you think that identity shift facilitated for you? Or now looking back, what do you do you see it as a as a rebirth or a, or, or or a kind of a name you needed to adopt in order to rebirth Jane in a way? I didn't know it at the time, but um, changing my name allowed me to um, separate from quite a large catalog, Jane Sibbery. So I, I went through the catalog, organized it, even redid the artwork. So it, so it was all consistent. Um, and no one really knew where to enter my catalog at a certain point. Um, I could sense that it's like, well, I know you'd like some of my music, but you don't know how to enter. So, um, it won't, you know, there won't be an exchange. So I closed the door on that and wanted to start fresh. And when I changed my name, you know, I did it on a train in Europe. Um, I got some help, you know, just deciding the exact timing of it, I suppose, you know, with an astrologer type um, thinking. I did it at a certain Mm. time and I was on a train and then I went to a jazz bar with this most beautiful and beautifully dressed father and son. Um, And I got, I said, I don't have to frown anymore if I don't want to. I'm not Jane Sibber anymore. I don't have to like always be worried. I can actually open my forehead and and I can smile and not worry about the space between my teeth or whatever. Silly things like that, but that's at least a, a good indication of the type of freedom it can give you. And then yeah. um, as I find often happens, I don't know if it's the same with you, it's big decisions are uh, come from, or I remember what the light was doing at that time. So I was in California walking along a street and the light was hitting the brick wall beside me on a certain angle and a certain color of warmth. And that's when I felt in my stomach, oh, it's time to change back or change forward to Jane Sibri. Do you find that? like? Well, it's, it's interesting. It's a good question. I don't know if 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 I track light, but what really I did resonate with was earlier when you spoke about the bridge. I have a lot of epiphanies on flights. Um, if I'm up in the air, and I've I, I asked my guides about that once, and they said, "Well, you're so far away from the density of the ground." And so when you talked about the bridge, and I'm like, "Oh yeah, oh. bridge." doesn't necessarily have roots down, but it has water underneath that. That kind of made sense to me. Although I know some bridges go over freeways and all kinds of things, but, uh, so yeah, I, I tend to have epiphanies when I'm lifted out of, um, regular circumstances. And I, 
I very much resonated with what you said about this is how the word I would put on it. You didn't use this word, but the responsibility that you suddenly got stuck in when you were doing Sheba and also the, you know, the, some of those dynamics that can come your way with certain people and how in a, in a way it sounds like you needed to shake that off and that the name change was a big part mm-hmm. of that. Did it bring your artistry, your creativity, your, your visionary back uh, quite quickly when you stepped out of the responsibility of Sheba? Um, or did it take time? Yes, it took time. But when I make decisions, like most people, you know, they're right, because all of a sudden you feel very light. You don't have you just like, oh, that's I didn't realize I'd feel so free. So it must be right. Um, But when more when I let go of my house and my things, because I felt like I was drowning or from heaviness, I noticed a lot of lightness there, like, and I did it in layers, too. And I I kept dreaming. I couldn't find the number of the junk dealer who kept coming and taking the next level of stuff away from me. <laughs> um, but it was almost as if all my energy that I'd looped around my possessions and, and the more beautiful they are, the you know more intense the energy. And I love beautiful things and people had given me beautiful things. And when I let go of them finally, um, and it included all the way down to like, photos from my whole life or letters from my whole life because I was in the time that I'd pictured earlier someday I'll sit down and on the floor with this box and all of a sudden I was in it Mm. ah okay so I I went in layers to the deepest level and I could feel my energy coming back like little dust balls to be with me again instead of uh, like a big spider you know extension way out there so i found that very interesting how how much of our energy is looped around other things uh, and what happens mm. when it it comes back on and is undistilled in your own container um that was interesting and um i shredded like crazy i had about 30 bags um of shredding the night that the garbage truck came i'd done it over like a couple months as I was letting go of everything in my house. And I remember feeling like a, a dog, like going out and looking to see, you know, m- middle of the night, have the garbage trucks come looking at them and putting them down at the neighbor's part of the street. And almost like I, I was guarding them. I don't know what I was guarding them from, but to get them safely into obscurity. But it was very interesting adventure. And and if anyone has a predisposition towards making a big change in your life, um, it's a uh, super interesting and super educational and super uh, can be super fun, you know, and as I would recommend this, my father always had what he called like a screwing fund when he went on holiday of 15% to write off for, you know, you know, you know, getting overcharged and stuff like that. And that's been very helpful since I learned it because uh, you have regrets, but I had budgeted for them. Hmm. That's interesting. Budgeting for your regrets. That's very cool. <laughs> it really works. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jane, one of the things, you know, I came to you, like I said, in 1995, but at that point you had been putting out records for well over a decade. And I actually have a few of few of your beautiful uh, vinyls here from, I think, I think all of these albums, if I'm not mistaken, came out sometime in the 80s. Um, and I'm curious because one of the things that I, I see with you when I go back and look at your early work is you were very much an artist musician. You know, everything that's very much in your artwork, in your covers and your music videos, you were you were very clearly a creative artist. Uh, that was very much part of your imprint. And I know that you have been a painter um, ever since I kind of discovered you, but I, I feel like the painting emerged more or perhaps you shared it more with your audience after the end of Sheba. So was painting something you'd always done and not just painting, but expressing yourself through the visual art medium in many different ways? Or was that something that came when you 
stepped away from being, shall we say, a recording artist in the traditional system? Um, uh, I've always seen paintings and I would, since I was young, I'd write them down in great detail in case I ever learned how to paint. And Oh, I have to ask you about that. So you'd write down the painting in great detail. So you would literally write a, a written description of what you were seeing. Wow, that's fantastic. Uh, but I never learned how to paint. So I became a musician, but a lot of my songs uh, start with a visual. Uh, I'll, like Seven Steps to the Wall, I saw mm -hmm. sort of a smoky room, but it was just really the dust motes in the sunlight. Uh, and a man sitting leaning over a table um, and then slowly it magnetized into a, a song about uh, um, uh, someone in jail and partly stimulated by a book called darkness at noon possibly um, I'm sorry I don't remember that name but and and someone kept saying to him don't turn around when they walk you down for your execution you know like so, um, hmm. so that, that was a visual I, and then it sort of drew magnetically from the ethers into something that, that I liked. So, um, then I took up painting when I was really bored in the studio. Cause like, there's a lot of waiting <laughs> in a studio and it's like, it's so boring. Like, Oh, are you finished? You know, with that kick drum sound or whatever. Um, Oh my God. Um, so I just started scribbling with a little Woolworths pad just to keep myself um, happy. And then, then it sort of grew from there. So it was more from boredom. I finally took it up and I see so many things I want to paint, but, um, but I, it's a magical thing. More I paint now when I hear a terrible story about an animal and then I'll paint the animal, uh, in a, in a beautiful form. Um, and you become so intimate with it, say, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And then, but you have to look at pictures and understand how an elephant's body is created and it becomes so exciting and intimate and you're never the same after that. So I use it for that too sometimes. And oh, honestly, I thought I can't seem to sell enough records to fund the music, so I seem to be able to sell paintings so in my quest to live as a healthy musician and not rely on grants or asking, which just, just, um, I have a bad attitude about that. I get, I can't stand it anymore. I tried to sell things and this and that. I, uh, just, um, it's a sick feeling for me anyway. So mm -hmm. I'm still in the middle mm -hmm. of finding a healthy way to, um, be a musician. And I know there must be. I know there must be. It's a, it's a very interesting thing, isn't it? Because the time that I grew up in, we used to buy our music. Or if it was played on the radio, it would be uh, that the radio station would have to pay a, a royalty or a fee or a licensing fee to, to the, the record label. And that's how people who are putting music out into the world earn their living, earn their wages. And one of the great gifts of this time is that there is the freedom to put your work out into the world like never before. And yet, of course, especially if we look at music, the streaming uh, model and reality, it just, I, I don't know how many people realize how, how difficult that is for a musician to create a quality of record that has the right kind of sound. It, it takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of expertise and, and a lot of funding. So yeah, I, I think that what you're saying is a is a creative problem that many musicians are having right now or having to figure out how do they how do they fund this thing that they feel driven and compelled to do but that isn't necessarily reciprocated um, financially in, in the world at this point. Um, that's a good way of putting it creative problems. <laughs> so who better than creative people to deal with it? So my way of uh, yeah, I've gone through periods where I say I guess I can't record anymore or you know I'm not going to do a, a cheap little recording and not use real strings where there should be real strings 
I can't do that. So I, I just can't. Um, so, uh, like I said, I'm a big believer in removing uh, life support and letting things be natural, you know, and, and things have to support themselves. So I think that we still haven't come up with the right answer, but there is a right answer. And, um, and so I'm thinking, I can't record anymore. So, well, I'm going to do what I always do. I'm going to record half a song and really beautifully and then go from there not knowing. Um, which which me, moves me back into like beginner's mind instead of like feeling sort of jaded and lower vibrations. Like I I I have I have songs I want to write. Am I just going to like cut myself off because of a stupid economic imbalance, um, or or just stick stick to the course somehow? So <clears throat> I don't know what the answer is yet, but this is how I'm dealing with it in my life now. Um, and I keep saying if the universe wants me to be pulled into the limelight again, which my, my stomach says, yes, for sure. Um, but I, I, I'm not of even faith all the time. So, um, that, that's, that's what I'm doing. And I feel the magnetism of <clears throat> a really wonderful collection of songs happening. So that also gives me some kind of confidence. Well, and I was very happy to see over your right hand shoulder when we first got on the screen and I asked you about the guitar behind you and I said, are those lyrics hanging on the pegs? It's uh, it's nice to see um, the creation. I know you're not at home right now. You're, you're, you're staying somewhere, but, but, uh, but it was nice to see the creative energy manifest behind you. Um, do you record demos yourself, Jane, and then take them to a studio or to people's home studios to work with musicians? Or do you find you always need to record in a studio with an engineer? I'm curious what your process is for beginning songs. Well, I, I usually write right on to final recording. That's that's what I like to do because I, I can feel it all here. And if I just go bang uh, with an engineer doing the that stuff, um, I really like that. But now I can't even have that anymore. So against my will, I've had to like relearn how to record on my own computer. So that's, uh -huh. that's how I do a lot of it. And I've taken courses now. I did that in the pandemic time period um, and even took music theory, which I've never taken. So I do them now on my computer um, as mu much as I can. And then uh, I, I, um, I'm, I'm not sure, but I'll be working with real musicians where required and um, might be remotely or I'm not sure, but I really, really like the energy created in a studio with people. Yeah. It's, it's very different, isn't it? It is. It is. And also you, I remember your album Maria. And when Maria came out, that was the first album of yours that I was conscious, or at least it was communicated very clearly that a lot of that was improvisational or all of it was improvisational. And, uh, that's a wonderful record. So it's interesting to hear you, you, you say that, but yeah, I do. I do think it's interesting when you have to change your way of operating, um, to kind of bring the music back forward. But, but one thing I, I just want to share that you did very recently, probably sometime within the last year, I'm on your newsletter and have been for many, many years, your muse letter, you call it. And it's always great because you're always doing different things and trying new things and creating differently. But one thing you did within the last year that was very powerful for me in this time where our attention is constantly being competed for, and you know, we all apparently now have no attention span anymore. You did this thing where you did a song a day and your newsletter was literally a song a day. And you you put the song and you, this is where you press play and these are the lyrics of the song. And it was this wonderful bringing of presence because it was a song I wasn't familiar with of yours. Um, and I did, I pressed play, I read the lyrics, I sat and was very present with the song. And I thought that was a very, uh, it was a very good way of just putting the focus on here, let's just give one song 
our attention and you would send that out uh, regularly uh, every day. It was great. Yeah, I think that was um, that was the one act. Uh, that was the radio play, right? I, you know, I was it was it it wasn't. I want to say, wasn't Misak Dreams Back or oh, Dreams Back? Yes. So, so it was like a radio play, and it had different acts and a lot yeah. of layers to it. And um, I, I think I hope that teachers use that someday um, because it'd be a fun thing for kids to study because there's nothing superfluous in it, like in, including. I have the um, Hebraic, Judaic um, names. Instead of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, or off to bed you go, as some mothers would sing, um, put in the, you know, the real names because they're famous for their, given, their imposed names. And, um, and then journeys in a temple. Like um, there's something that's always bothered me, which is that, Know thyself is above a lot of university doors. Know thyself in Latin or whatever, but they never say why. Like why? Okay, like okay, I know myself and I'm fucked up, you know. So what's? Tell me something new or useful. But but then I read somewhere, know thyself that that thou mayest know God, hmm. which is huge and deep and beautiful. So I, all these things I made into sort of a story. Um. And and sometimes it's like the fool, so to speak, going up the steps and, you know, this and that. And I think it's quite funny. So I'd love a teacher, teachers to, um, I wouldn't skip class. Um, um, but what, oh, I, new topic. We've all heard adages through time since we're young, like be here now, um, that book so many people read and, you know, um, be present. And it's always bugged me that people don't say, well, how? Okay, like, I'll be here now, but, like, what does that mean? What would that look like if I was being here now? And um, so uh, some of the songs on my new recording are, like, me talking to me. Like, be present. Why should we be present? Well, because when you are present, you're like a child, which is until you, you become as little children, you may not enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not like signs up, you know, you can't go there, you're too tall. It's like beginner's mind. We've heard that too. It's like um, find that space in yourself and then the door opens up, the portal opens up to perfect joy. But so many things are confusing. So in this new recording, I'm trying to... Um, speak to myself in a way that I can understand. So be present, be present. What does that look like? Well, you simply go to your five senses. So you're earthly, you know, uh, what do you hear? What do you see? What do you taste? What do you feel? Um, what do you smell? And all of a sudden you're pulled away from your thoughts or your deep meditative place. You're pulled right into I think that's what being present is. And um, so um, the point of saying this was um, just other little nigglies I have that I'm trying to straighten out. And I do that through my music, speaking to myself often, which I think hmm. perhaps a lot of people do. Yeah. Has it has it changed for you a lot over because you've been what creating music now? Uh, for for a while, have you noticed it? it it's re, its relationship in your life, or or it, the way that you approach it is 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 very different to many decades ago. Or do you think it's still, you know, is that the thread that runs through then and now this this conversation with yourself or the universe? When I took my catalog and put it together so I could change my name, I was quite pleased to see that there was a consistency from beginning to end. I pretty well believed myself, not always, but for the most part, it it pretty, it pretty felt pretty authentic consistently. That said, I imagine, I imagine that will be, you know, till my dying breath or note or whatever my di last dying something is, um, hopefully a, a laugh or something. 
Um, I have changed some things. I, I don't have patience in myself for being afraid as much. Mm. So I try not to sm- have a smoke screen. I love abstract songs, but, um, but there's a different kind of abstract that comes from fear. So I usually use the words you now. So I'm like, let's get in, let's get out. Let's not waste time with each other unless it's really direct. So that's changed. Um, and, and now on this new recording, it's almost like more conversations, like argue arguments with myself, except I'm putting them out into different people's voices. Like, but how could, like, for example, how can we be present when, um, I'm thinking about how to be present. So I'm not present, you know, sort of people talk, <laughs> discussing these things with each other. And, um, so that's changed or exaggerated with more pressure from within, you know, as time goes on. Your record, when I was a boy, I immediately think of the song Temple, uh, and, and perhaps a few of the songs on that record, which Calling All Angels, the original recording with KD, the duet version was, was on. And it's interesting because, you know, I, for me, what I always felt in your music was this backbone of spirituality, even though it wasn't necessarily upfront and overt. I think that there was always an elemental, to me, you were elemental, creative, magical. Those were the three things that I knew I would get from a Jane Sibbery record, but, and, and humor actually, but un, a humor about the human condition, but underneath there was this spiritual backbone. And I think of Temple and I think of when I was a boy and, and songs like Love is Everything. And like, to me, they are, they are very spiritually, uh, born of a deep spirituality, whatever that looks like for you, whatever your faith or your religion or your denomination is, is that, is that something you're aware of running through you or is that something I'm projecting or is that something you've come to see is there that you weren't as aware of back then? Just curious. Well, Lee, I would say that your assumptions are correct. I feel, oh, I thought you'd frozen again, but you just like, no, don't know what to say. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I I really stay away from my left brain getting involved, and I've always known that wasn't the way to go. So um, I try not to be overtly spiritual, but the things I care about are in spirit as they're invisible. You know, it's, it's the moments between people that I love to try to describe. It's the silence between things that is so poignant and wondrous. So um, I think that's very spiritual as in it's an invisible and connected to the greater, you know, that moves me. And um, I, I love m- connection in music. That's all I care about or connection in film or connection in paintings or whatever. That's all I care about. Um, technique is um, a little bit of an aside you know, and I think that's what everyone craves is connection in any mm. way. And music is, ha- happens to be one of the most powerful ways to connect. If mm. it's coming, if it's, um, if it's uh, inspired, anything mm. inspired. But... What aside from music and creating music has, has brought you connection or joy in this past, let's say year or right now? Oh, right now. Oh, every day I walk with my my dog. He's a rescue, and spend time with him. And I um, I'm in. I feel so privileged to spend time with an animal. It's amazing, and so I have a lot of joy with him, or or watching how he does things that's natural, and thinking, yeah. Um, he hasn't been put upon by a lot of um, domestic domestication as a dog. So when I see his code in the park, it's very different than a dog that's always been cosseted and happy, which is great. Um, but he won't tolerate a dog coming up to him and not recognizing his language, like 
in his face and stuff. He'll growl and make them back off. And so I'm, I learned so much from watching him and, and, um, it's important. And he's a Jindo. He's from North, he's from Korea. He's like, um, an Akita or something unchanged. And, um, and so many times he reflects back to me. He doesn't, but I see that I'm like talking down to him or like, why do I feel I have to say, oh, good dog, good dog, say it twice. You're like, um, I'll just be cool and not say anything. Then um, anyway, that's the kind of learning I have partly from having an animal in my life. And learning I find really stimulating. So I'm taking courses and I'm really um, no, music theory so I can actually write my own charts now for the first time. Wow. Um, I, I t- taken, took some animal communication courses because mm. I'm dying to, like, I don't want to know like, what someone wants to eat. I want to know what did you observe about that person that made you go to him or back away from him? I want that kind of information. And I know it's there. I, I'm just so curious about all this, but I haven't been able to make the leap. Um, but that's a, always been a big goal in my life. That and um, sex as I think it should be, you know. Or making love, I guess, whatever. Um, life goals. So to communicate with um, other living creatures and and both aligning with something inside me that feels like it's possible and right, but I haven't found it yet. Mm. Beautiful. I also, may I say something more? Yes, please. It really bugs me that the Western medical system is always guessing like, Oh, it could be this, could be that. It's like, no, there's just one answer. It's not multiple answers. There's one answer. This, this chemical pathway is um, being whatever triggered by a hormone or whatever. And it's, that's the kind of information I also want. And it just bugs me that I can't hear it because I, Everyone's experimenting on my mother and um, friends, and it just frustrates me so much because I know there's one answer and I can't hear it. So that's a, that's a third goal. You got me mm. talking about my, my deepest yeah. desire. That's great. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing. I mean, I think our deepest desires are what make us who we are, and they're part of our path. So, um. So Jane, the, 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 the work that you're working on now, as someone who is a fan of your music, um, do you have a sense of, will it be maybe 23 or 2024 that we might get to, to hear this new body of work from you? Um, I'm, I'm aiming for 23. Um, I just have to stop every time I run out of money, but I think, um, that is part of the universal plan too. So it could be 24. Every mm. time I try to like nail something down time-wise, it, it busts out in rebellion. So yeah. um, 23 or 24, or I don't know whether it'll, I used to think I'll just put out singles because that seemed practical, but no, no, no. A, a larger storytelling for the people who like what I do anyway, and for me, is is um, feels Right. So I have about 20 songs now and a lot of words like, whoo, but so I'm trying to find a way to make it acceptable and spacious um, at the same time that it has a lot of density to it. But that's the fun of it. I may die before I get it finished and (laughs) you'll have to, you'll have to listen to the demos and try to recreate that, isn't that isn't that the truth for any of us we none of us ever know so it's like do do what you can while you're here um i'm just curious have you i know there was a period going back in time where you did i don't know if i would call it fundraising for your album but i think i remember there was a you know there were there were options of ways we could help 
fundraise. I'm just curious what your perspective is on things like Patreon or crowdfunding. You know, are they things you feel aligned with or not really? No, no, it made it, turned everyone into monkeys and it was demeaning, I felt, insulting. But a lot of people, a lot of musicians, we don't know what works and we, we have no business training and everyone's saying use these, you know, formulas. But um, I didn't really like seeing my friends doing it, you know, say, please, 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 when in fact what feels best to the listener and the creator is that it's a it's um a dignified position to be in you know but so i did kickstarter once and i'll never do it again i tried it um patreon nah. that's for me it's if you can change the systems the formulas so they they are you know dignified and a lot of people don't want a lot of bells and whistles why did we believe that everyone needs a, so um Often I'll just fund, I mean, I'll support someone, but I don't even want the recording because I know I, I won't listen quietly. So I just, just help. And I think anonymous giving is really important, or that's how I try to do it. Mm. Um, anonymous emails. and Because then I don't, I know my ego won't get involved and there won't be any gratitude other than, you know, anyway, so I have something on my website now where people can, if they want to be involved, it's like, if you want to be part of this and, you know, whatever you can, it's, it's, it's not, please, I don't know. I just tried to put it in a way that felt okay with my stomach. So people are welcome to, and you can give anonymously if you want, We've set it up yeah. so people can be anonymous, but, um, so it's yeah. left very open, which is which is which is your way. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to say I don't want to raise money. I have to. I've tried everything, you know, jobs, bed yeah. and breakfast, whatever. Um, so I don't want to say no to being given things, mm -hmm. but I tried to do it in a way that felt comfortable to me. I think one of the tricky things with Patreon is is if you are going to do Patreon, you do need to be willing to produce regularly. I think that's, you know, that's one of the important things with Patreon. And it's funny because I have I support a few people on Patreon and I probably engage with the work of one of them, but I'm very happy to be a monthly supporter because I, I love what they do, I love their work. But like you said, I'm not I'm not necessarily going to look at everything and but that doesn't that's not that's not why I'm involved. I'm it's a way that they feel good or can align with being supported and it's a way I can support. So, so I love that you have something on your website that, that in your way offers that ability to people who, who enjoy and want to support your work. Yeah, it's, it's a big responsibility asking for money. And I remember, um, I guess when I'd been on Sheba for a while and knew I wanted to do new music and people wanted it, but, um, I, I actually had, you could buy studio hours. So you knew exactly where the money was going from. It wasn't going towards me, um, you know, taking a cab when I'm too lazy, you know, or things like that. Um, and it was accountable and you'd get like, this is your day. I used four hours of studio time. This is what we did. Yeah. But um, it's pretty labor intensive. I like it just clean and clear. Now I prefer. Um, and, uh, um, I couldn't bear it if I took people's money and then didn't do what I said I'd do. I mean, I think that's why why I will probably never get married. I could not bear it if I vowed something and then broke it. I don't hmm. think I couldn't bear that. So the same thing with money. If, if you um, say, oh, Patreon and I'll send you a newsletter out every month and but what if I'm in writing mode and I can't write every month because it's not right with the universe. You have to obey the universal flow, not what you thought with your left brain. I'll send a letter out. Every so I couldn't do that kind of stuff. Um, yes. Unless, unless I set it up as flexible somehow.
Sure. And in fact, I do know with Patreon, you have the option of either being a monthly supporter or a per thing supporter. So it could be that you don't do anything for 10 months and then nobody pays their $2, $5, $10, whatever tier they're in at. So, well, Jane, thank you. I'm going to tell everybody to visit janesibbery.com and we will put the link underneath uh, in the show notes of this video and this audio. And um, I highly recommend your newsletter to everyone listening and watching because you're up to all kinds of art things that you uh, that you share as and when. You know, we might not hear from you for quite a while and then we might hear from you a few times. And I think there's something lovely about that. So, um, so yeah, thank you for thank you for sharing a bit of your your process, your world, and for coming on and being on the show. I'd like to just complete it with, I hope everyone feels um, empowered to do that too. It's not just me. It's, I feel it's, um, I'm part of a group of people already doing a lot of things that I'm saying. And that gives me a real sense of community, which um, I thought man was an island, but I really now agree that no man is an island, that we're social creatures and we are highly nourished by contact with others. But um, so yeah, I'd like to just say I wish the very best for anyone who's listening to this um, to, you know, that we trust ourselves and that um, all the good that comes from that, trusting our divine within, um, can be felt somewhere on the other side of the world um, where it might be needed. I think that's partly what we're all doing. I'm so glad to be part of it and and I am um, grateful to have a group of spirits um arm in arm with them you that's one of the reasons i i was excited to have you on the show jane because you know one of the things i've always enjoyed about you and admired about you is you carve your unique path and as we're all educating each other i've always learned something from that and so i know there will be people watching this listening to this who will resonate and will hopefully feel empowered to do more of that themselves so thank not you so from, much not from me but from trusting themselves is what i was saying exactly yeah, yeah. but I, I don't know about you i'm always it's who i it's who i see in the world and how they model things to me is how i've often learnt you know not necessarily trying to be them but you see someone else giving themselves permission to do it mm -hmm. differently to the way everyone else is it kind of gives you permission to do it differently to the way everyone else is it might look different but you you need to see you need to see that it, everywhere so thank you so much for bringing yeah. your unique spirit to this this show and this conversation and i for one will be looking forward to the new music and the new newsletters and everything that you do thanks lee you're lovely thank you my friend for those of us who are sensitive intuitive or walking a spiritual path it is our practices and the support that we have in our life that often is the key to how well we can walk through life. Nine years ago, I created the portal to be an answer to that need for members of my community who wanted to go more in depth with my work. And while my work is still very much a centerpiece of the portal, we have now added other teachers, other voices, other offerings, so that the portal can become a well-rounded place for you to receive nourishment and be uplifted shifted and supported every single month. Here is a look at some of the offerings that you receive every month as a portal member. Once a month, I do a 90 minute live video broadcast. Don't worry if you can't be there live, everything in the portal is provided to you as a replay, but doing it live is a chance for me to be with you as a community. And in that broadcast, I channel I speak about the energies of the month and expand on my monthly energy update and also take some community questions. Every month you will also receive an mp3 and the mp3 will either be a channeled message from my guides the Z's set to original music from Davo Bozik or it will be an energy alchemy meditation or some other energy teaching. These will be put into your members library and you will have access to them to stream and download. We also give you access to a classics library where we take eight classic recordings from recent years so that you can listen to more. 
Qigong and wellness teacher Stephen Washington gives you an exclusive Qigong sequence every single month. It's called the Body Energy Update and he takes the themes from my monthly energy updates on YouTube and creates a movement sequence for you designed to support you and your process as we go through each month. Stephen is also a wonderful meditation teacher and so you will have access to a library of short, digestible meditations from him. As soon as you join, you will also get access to our bonus Intuitive Power Workshop. This was a tour that we took to several different countries a couple of years ago, and we had it professionally filmed. So you will be able to watch a four and a half hour video workshop where both myself and Steven teach you about accessing and owning your intuition in a deeper way. And to round all of this out, we have special member discounts on courses of mine. We also have special music playlists each month. One set of songs designed to help soothe you and one set of songs designed to get you moving. And last year, we brought to the portal something I've wanted to do for a very long time, The Portal Presents. It's where I get to invite some incredible teachers, creatives, healers, musicians into the portal. And every month we spotlight one of them where they deliver an on-camera teaching specifically for our portal members. It's a beautiful new feature. We have had some incredible people coming in and we've got some amazing people lined up for the next year. And the final aspect of the portal is mine and my team's favorite. It's the community energy. So as well as having a private members forum inside the portal for those of you who aren't on social media, we also have a private moderated Facebook group exclusively for portal members. This is where so many members get to share what they're experiencing, things they're learning, people they're enjoying, and essentially connecting you with people from all over the world who are focused on similar interests to you. My aim with the portal has always been to offer you as much value for your membership as possible. And I feel like in the last year or so, we have really been able to maximize that. So we look forward to welcoming you to the portal and we hope it is a place that can nourish your mind, your body and your soul. Big love.